gone back with Kerouac Get a little smashed with our Dinesh Start to read with Daniel Steele Slosh some gin with Anna Eastman It's time to get lit faced while you are Day drinking with Arthur Hey everybody! Happy Victoria Day! Today is uh, is a long weekend up here in Canada. Not that that matters anymore. Days are barely even days anymore. <laughs> um, my guest, I'm so excited to have her here today. And we didn't even plan this with Victoria Day, but a, a Canadian author is visiting. Uh, not only is she an amazing author who straddles genres with absolute ease and grace and like intelligence. Uh, but she's also a very generous indie publisher who has like a super laser focused insight into the industry. And more than that, um, every time I see her, I, I want to give her like half of a best friends forever blocket or like a friendship bracelet. <laughs> I can barely resist the urge to ask her to be my best friend forever. But so, but you'll, you'll see, you'll find out. So without any further ado, ado here's a, Zoe York slash Ainsley Booth. I know, this is perfect timing. Oh, I can't. I'm, there you are. You and are. then I started talking. There we go. And then you are. Wait. wait. <laughs> I'm not the best listener at times, Molly. I'm hey, so excited to be here. It's really perfect. Yeah. It is perfect. It's Victoria Day. Yeah, we're we didn't plan that even a little bit. <laughs> Did, I had on. actually I had forgotten that we had a long weekend in May because what are weekends anyway? So <laughs> I will say I weirdly cling to Friday nights. Like Friday nights have always been a big deal at our house, and I I I still cling to those. But I don't know why <laughs> anymore. But tell us about our drink. Tell us what we're yes. doing. So I just made my drink in a live video in my reader group, um, the Wardham Ambassadors, which is named for a made up town in Canada. Um, and it's a Michelada, which apparently is actually really popular in, uh, it's a Mexican drink, but I thought that they made it with tomato juice, but apparently it's actually really popular to make it this way. Like it's not actually that Canadian at all to make it with Clamato, right? So it's, in, so for Canadians, it's a Caesar, but made with beer instead right. of vodka. And um, it is just the most refreshing drink I think I've ever had. I know. If if this was a proper May 2-4, yeah. we'd be on someone's dock yeah. drinking a ton of it. Uh, but I will say, I, I, I um, the, so the only times that I've ever had this drink in the States, I always get it with a Negro Modelo, which is the dark. Right. Like, yeah. So I'm using a Waterloo Dark in mine. And how is that? It is so delicious. Yeah, I'm going to so try delicious. that. I will try Yeah, you like it. I am drinking it as per the recipe with a Molson Canadian. But actually, actually my because we have tested, my husband and I have tested this a lot over the last two weeks. Um, you know, you want to be, you want to pick the right recipe for day drinking with authors. Don't and, mess around. Don't I mess around. <laughs> And um, my actual, my, my, my first choice for this is a Michelob Ultra because it makes it so refreshing on a hot day. Like we had a hot day a couple of, like about a week ago and oh, you can drink like three or four of those. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not going to lie. My preference is uh, a dark beer and I put a shot of vodka in mine. <laughs> I don't know. So we, I mean, <laughs> why mess around? Oh, we've got a lot to talk about. We've got a lot to talk about. We've got to talk yeah. about drinking. So I want to remind you, everybody, and I see so many people here. Kelly, hello. Mara, hello. Betty Taylor, Darlene, thank you for coming out. Um, if you ask questions, uh, we are giving stuff away. Um, I I'll give away some books. Zoe will give away some books. We're going to give away a, a gift card to an independent bookstore. Um, Maybe Canadian, if you happen to be Canadian, that would be absolutely perfect on this Victoria Day weekend. Um, 
So be sure to ask questions and I will try to keep an eye on this. Are these made by the glass or pitcher? Sharon wants to know. Yeah. I mean. There's no wrong answer. <laughs> Both, all of the above. So, for sure. far, so far, I have done the glass, but you could absolutely do a pitcher. But I think that by the glass yeah. keeps the beer fizzy. And that's part of the refreshing. Mm -hmm. So I'm. I have a martini shaker full of my mix and then half a beer to keep putting in there to really get you behind the scenes. Um, so Day Drinking with Authors was supposed to be for authors who have a release coming up and I've been very good about reading the books of all of my guests that they are promoting. And you had sent me the cover and you were like, any minute now, Molly, you're gonna get this manuscript. <laughs> but I think, how are things off the rails or are you doing okay? Oh, I'm doing fine. So the truth is, is that, um, and this is like a, this is a double-edged sword of indie publishing. Um, I like never finish a book way in advance. If I finish a book way in advance, that's super, like that's the exception. And um, I always say, oh, I'll do arcs. I'll do, you know, I'll, you no, know, I never do. I always, <laughs> <laughs> indie publishing aligns really well with my undiagnosed ADHD. It's now diagnosed, but it was undiagnosed for the first seven years of my career. Um, and I just, I, I, yeah. So I always write pretty close up to the actual release and I revise and I've been working on this book for three years. Why is it not done? Such a good question. So Reckless at Heart, this is the first in a new series in your very, very popular Pine Harbor series. Yeah. So when I was writing book seven, so there's eight books in the first Pine Harbor series. And when I was writing book seven, I met Owen Kincaid, who's the hero of Reckless at Heart. I met him on the page and immediately yeah. knew. So he's a he's a 37-year-old dad of an 18-year-old. And I immediately knew, oh, I so desperately want to write his story. So I started writing his story. Then I was in the middle of a different book and I stopped and I wrote the first chapter. And then life happened and other books happened. And um, and I, I made myself wait until I finished the first series. Um, and now it's finally Owen's turn. But so I've been writing it kind of like full time since December. Okay. All right. So when is the release? June 2nd in two weeks. June 2nd. And, how, yeah. and where? <laughs> I mean, I have the opposite of this. I have hives. I have hives. I know. I, hives. I, I know. I, I think I got, uh, oh, I'm not, I'm almost at 70,000 words. Like I'm, you know, I'm getting there. Do you, are you, do you, will it go to a copy editor after this? I mean, you're you're a pretty clean writer. Yeah. Are you? I mean, so so it has been um, it has been we my my dev editor my poor dev editor Christy and I um, she's looked at the first third of this book like I don't know six times. It hasn't been six oh. times. It probably six times. Um, and then um, like the first half has already been um, copy edited. And so the second, it'll kind of go in waves. You cannot change. It is, you can't change a thing. There's no, no exciting yeah. brainstorms. It is just head down to the end. Oh, yeah, no, and I'm past that. Like I only get those like wild idea changes until I hit kind of the mid two thirds point. Like once, once we're at the end of the second act, like that's it, like we're, the, book, the yeah. story is so cemented. Um, and and the last third of most of my books are written that way in the last two or three weeks before release. All right. So this is nothing new for you. Nobody no. be alarmed. This is Nobody all important. Yeah. Yeah. So I have to say, and I don't know that I've ever said this to you before, but um, I actually came to your work through Ainsley Booth, oh. which is your, your, your other name, yeah. through um, Hate, Hate F. Hate a, I, I call it HF. Whenever I'm referring to it out loud, I say HF. That HF book I wrote. That HF book you wrote with like with like truly the hottest cover and like the perfect title. Like honestly, go look at this right now, everybody. Um, so I came to you through Ainsley, and it, it is what I felt was advertised. Like it was a spicy, dramatic, uh, angsty read, and I sort of thought um, your Zoe York books 
I felt had been like billed to me as like small town romances. So it took me a while to get to those. But then once I got to those, I realized like, no, you're actually writing, you're actually writing like women's fiction. You're, you're, you're writing yeah. big stories with lots of conflict and really deep seated things happening in these books. Like, uh, that that are often seen in women's fiction and maybe not so much in romance. Um, yeah, it's kind of like, but I I think of it as like really hot women's fiction, which isn't a thing, and I wish it was more of a thing. I feel like a lot of small town romance. I think that small town romance is often shorthand for many different things, right? Clean. And so, and there are yeah, yeah. Cool like some be, be really cut cool, like soft and and warm and safe and heartwarming yeah. and i do have some of those heartwarming elements in my stories um but i also feel like romance <laughs> i mean the yeah, thing well, you know it's like a, a terrible miscarriage subplot and like marriage in jeopardy every time they turn around which is what i love anyway i'm sorry i didn't interrupt go ahead no, no, no. it's true it's true that like i they're not, not safe stories but they're often like the like the big difference between Ainsley and Zoe, other than you know, there's a there's a there's a like I write first person in one and third in the other, and um, you know there are some sex acts that I haven't put on the page so much as Zoe. But the real difference for me is that as Zoe, there's no doubt ever that it's going to be like the the worst thing that the characters do to each other is already known on the page on page one. Like my characters are not going to hurt each other. Oh my god! Yeah. Hold on a second. My mind is blown for just a second. So you're saying in the Zoe York books, the worst thing is their backstory, and they're recovering yeah. constantly from. Oh my god! Damn it, Zoe! That's <laughs> that is cool. I didn't write that down. Oh my god! I didn't realize that about myself. For years, for years. And it wasn't until, hang on, I've got a copy of it right here. I'm just gonna reach past my computer. It wasn't until this book and my and I, my dead editor is truly to be credited for this because she helped me figure out that the, so you know how some people are like, I don't like flashbacks and I don't like them either. Except I write them, I write them all the time. And so um, in the first couple of books, well, as a reader, I often say, I don't oh. think I like flashbacks, which is actually not true. I like it when a flashback is real. I mean, I mean, that's true for literally everything. I don't like secret babies either. And yet, you know, Carolyn Crane writes one and I'm like all, all over it. <laughs> but, um, but this book, I started it, I wrote it linearly. And my editor is like, why do you not start in the middle of the story and then do a flashback thing? And I was like, yeah, because people hate those. And she went, yeah, but this way you bury the real trauma in the middle of the book and you don't do that. That's not how you write. And then I talked about it with a writing coach, Becca Syme, you know, the write better, faster, quick cast person. And I was like, yeah, I don't write like that. Like the trauma is always known. Page one, always. Like man, it, okay. So let me let me ask this question too. Have a big drink of that before you answer this question because we're getting deep. Do you feel like your readers know that going into a Zoe York book? Do you think they have that? <laughs> I don't know. That's all. Uh, so I, I have shared this to my to my reader group, my Facebook reader group. I have a watch party going on, so. I'm just gonna like wave at them and be like, guys, if you have an answer to that, please let us know in the comments. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I'm, you know, as an author, like it's right, as as a self-published author, as a, as a publisher, yeah, I yeah. struggle hard with how do you convey that the theme and and the core of your, you know, your story that you tell over and over and over again, which is really. Like if you're gonna if you're gonna really make a success as an author, I think you need to know what that core story is so that you can properly hook and tease people with it. And how do you what what's the hooky, what's the high concept version of don't worry, everything's fine, just the worst thing happens on page one? Like Yeah. I don't yeah. know. I don't know if my readers know that or not. I convinced them that 
do you understand why I want her to be my best friend now? <laughs> do you get it? <laughs> It's, I mean, it's, it's like the wildest thing to me is as a writer having these breakthroughs seven years in, or for you, it's more than seven years, a lot more than seven years. Uh, you're a pro at this, and yet I don't you, know that I, shit. I haven't figured I, that out. I have been in how many workshops that you've delivered where in the middle of the workshop you stop and make a note for yourself? Well, wow. like. Yeah. You know, like that is the best, the best part of being a writer is constantly discovering the joy of writing. Yeah, I agree. I totally agree. I totally agree. Like it, it, the, the thing about it, I, I mean, I feel, I mean, I, I don't know how you're doing in, you know, COVID our COVID life, but like, you know, these are not easy days. And when it's really, uh, you got to cling to those things when it's going well, or when you stumble on some something that feels like a real honest truth or, you know, that is insightful to you or unveils something to you. Like you've got to like, you've got to, I, I, one thing that I have learned in my career is that you've, you've got to be like ready for it. You've got to be primed for it all the time because you don't know when it's going to happen. Like the second you sure. shut off that opportunity, forget it. But also, but also don't freak out if you miss that opportunity, there will be another one, right? It's like both be ready and do not beat yourself up if you miss it, because there isn't just one. Yeah, I find Often it like, and, and I think like Zoe, to me, you sort of encompass this, like there's a lot of like, you know, on the spectrum of writing, on the spectrum of industry, on the spectrum of, you know, publishing success, you have to be ready and prepared to be on, sorry, I'm like off camera. You've got to be ready and prepared to be on both sides of that. like a failure and a success, you know, ready and completely not ready, you know, like all of those things you it's, and that's the magic and the hard part, I think. Yeah. My friend, um, Nikki Haverstock shared a, a clip. It was an interview with Neil Patrick Harris. And he talked about how, when he was 15, Stephen Bochco said to him this, this career, and he means acting, but it's the same for writing is like surfing, right? And you will spend the vast majority of your time waiting for a wave, and then you're gonna grab the wave and it may or may not work out. And when you go tumbling off, it's mortifying and you just have to paddle and get back up on and wait again. And yeah. you might wait, you wait, you wait so much longer than you ever surf that wave. Yeah, that's so, so true. true. Yeah. Um, can I, can we, we're going to circle back to, yeah. so if the, if the promise that you have for the Zoe books is that the trauma happens on page one and after that, it's all about healing. Yeah. Have you thought that clearly about uh, Ainsley? Who is your alter ego? Yeah. Who, who, so, I mean, I haven't written, I haven't written nearly as many Ainsley books. So I don't have, I don't have as clear an idea at this point of what um, Ainsley is. I do know what Ainsley isn't. I, I know the reason why Ainsley exists is because Ainsley is not Zoe. Ainsley is where I write the stories that I just know in my heart I can't write as Zoe. Okay. Give us okay give us so, a of, of, of prime minister or or hate, yeah, hate okay. where i found you yeah so prime minister is a great example because um or like so i wrote hf as a one-off it was going to be a serial and it was it was originally released in three parts with cliffhangers um and it did like okay like it like it did okay um and then i wrote then i bundled it together and I released it as a single book and it hit the USA Today and I went okay all right I'm going to continue this series and then I wrote one more book in that series and then things and that series is set in Washington DC and I don't think I yeah. need to go further there in 2016 things took a turn and it was no longer fun to write that series and um and I thought about I mean I think that I think at one point I was at a conference with a group of people, probably some of them watching right now, and I spent the entire time going, I just need to murder Ainsley. I just need to kill her off. And people, <laughs> and people oh were like, God. "You, what you actually probably need is therapy around how Ainsley <laughs> is to, you know, I don't know, do something. So, but then, but then I had the idea for Prime Minister. And 
I just knew it. Like, I mean, it's more, it's much lighter than HF. Yeah. Um, and it could be a Zoe book, but it's not because there's heartache towards the end. And it's, it's not, it's, it's nothing that I don't, it's, it's just, it's a more like that. It has that classic, you know, bleak yeah. moment crisis that I just don't write those um, because I, yeah, there is a bit more of the hero or heroine, like the, the, the traditional dark moment in romance, yeah. you know, f for those who, who may not, no, like it's the it's the moment where where all seems lost, and in in large part the hero or the heroine is like actively hurting the other for whatever yeah. you know made up reason, and that yeah, there is a bit more of that in Ainsley for sure. Yeah, and I mean it's not it's not particularly prolonged, and the and the hurt comes from backstory. It's not an active present day hurt. Um, I you know, but there is some of that, and and in. So in subsequent books, I have sometimes done that with them. I don't want to say Ainsley books are just about hurting each other. That's wrong. But it's about, it's about, it's just, it's, it's a riskier read. It's a more, um, like I have a duet coming out this fall where that's, that's mostly written that I have held off on releasing because I went back and forth and back and forth on the right way to present it because there's an exceptional amount of, trauma on the page like every so often I like a lot of writers want to write writing is sometimes how we process stuff what we see in the world and 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 you know and there's a lot in relation like here's the thing about that I find about romance in general it, the, my favorite thing about it is digging into what people really think inside an intimate relationship and sometimes yeah. usually I want to say, you, and if you're reading a Zoe York book, if you're reading a Zoe York book, that is always a loving, safe, protected relationship. But that's not how all relationships are. Some relationships have incredibly rocky periods. And I, at times, want to explore that. And I think it's interesting that you picked up that I have, like, I'm so enamored with women's fiction themes and so frustrated by the thought that I can't, can't have a 10 page scene where they explore that tension naked. Like, yeah. right. Sometimes you just you want to tell them I go go and you, you don't rarely get it in women's fiction. <laughs> rarely. I mean, it's an under, it's an, it's an underserved niche, right? So it really is. Well, I, I mean, and it's, it's funny, like talking this, talking about this with you and the the difference between the I mean the the promise that you set out with Zoe and the promise you set out with Ainsley um it's kind of the the same promise just where the where the the trauma is placed in the story and that you know and and in Ainsley it is sort of it is obviously hotter and it's first person which makes a big deal to some readers but like you really sure. manage pardon Fewer than I thought. Like full disclosure, the reason why yes, I hated I a weird <laughs> full disclosure. Um, the reason why I have a second pen name is because the title was HF, um, and and then two because I thought that the first person versus third would be a deal breaker for some readers, and then there were cliffhangers, and it was mostly the cliffhangers then the title, and then the first person. But I really hung on to that first person thing for a long time. But recently, a reader friend of mine, very smart, Jessica Alcaraz, uh, said, um, Alcazar, why did I say her last name wrong? Anyway, it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, she said, I have two, I have two Facebook reader groups. And she's like, why do you have two Facebook reader groups? Like you don't post in the Beavers, which is my Ainsley group, nearly as much as you post in the Wardham group. And I'm like, that's true. Why? And so I, I, the other day I posted a poll. I said, who's in this group only? And I did it in both groups. Who's in this group? Who's in this group? How do you feel about me merging them? They're all in the same, they're like 90% yeah. of the people in one group are in the other. They all read my stuff. Now there are some people who are not like fans. It's like, you know, there's casual readers who only read Ainsley stuff, and but only when, you know, on release. 
and I mean, I could go into that for like literally hours. I talk about this a lot on my YouTube channel. There's a big difference between that front list, who you can cold sell books to, and the people yeah. who will buy all of your books when they release. And part of part of my, and I don't know, like I don't, I don't want to, um, I don't want to say like it's right or wrong, but it has worked for me. Is I focus on that core group of people who, once they've read one of my books, they just read through the list. Like that, that's just how my brain works. That's I build a relationship yeah. with them, and so I don't really, you know, like that's at one point I thought, oh, it matters. But you know what? Even even if I thought, oh, it doesn't matter, uh, I will always have two pen names because then I can get two book bubs in months. <laughs> As a person with three pen names, I do think there, with each iteration, there are some people who aren't going to read that next thing, right? And yeah. and and you start off every pen name like absolutely respectful of that fact. Oh, you, <laughs> the shot of vodka that I had, Miss, is coming through, but I'm going to say it anyway. You, you know, like you've got the people who like, you know, uh, third person, clear cut romance. You like the people who like first person, perhaps some mention of anal sex, and then you have the people who don't, like who don't want any romance even at all in my life, right? Like you, mm -hmm. those are my three readers. Third person, straight up romance. First person, perhaps some anal sex, not no romance at all. And I, you gotta yeah. respect all three of those fans. It's really, it's, it's, oh, like I, I I have yet to write a women's gym book that doesn't open uh -oh. the bedroom door. Zoe is freezing up. Uh, I think that. Uh oh. Am I back, frozen? No, I think no. you're back. Am I back? You're back. Okay, go back. Oh, I'm back. Oh, that was so stressful. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> but I recently, like my last number of releases, um, I really, it's, I, I have, I have felt myself being pulled in the women's fiction direction really clearly, uh, until like the 50 or 60% part of the book. And then it's like pure Ainsley influence for quite a while. <laughs> and, or in my Ainsley book, like even my Wicked Sin, which was my last Ainsley release last year. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I talked about it being like a 50,000 word police procedural wrapped around 20,000 word uh, dubious consent kink. And <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a tricky one to punch, but you did it. <laughs> I did it. I did it and I loved it. And um, and I feel like, you know, thank you to, to my readers who, who tolerate that sort of thing. But um, you know, there is also something to be said for like being a little bit tighter in your, you know, understanding the genre conventions and all of that. Well, you know, I mean, this is one thing that I know to be true about romance readers is that they'll, I mean, they follow, they, they, they follow, a, I mean, I, I'm going to say this as a romance reader. I mean, there, there are people I'll read forever, whatever they put out, like romance readers will follow you into the dark. <laughs> You know, they will not back down. Um, we do have a question real quick. Uh, Bridget Hickey is asking, how many books have you written? And that's a really good question. I don't know the answer. Um, so don't know the answer precisely, but I think it's 57. You, you think it's, it's how many? Somewhere between 55 57. And you wrote those in like 10 minutes. Like how long have you been a full-time author? Like, I mean, full-time, like, working on this full-time. Full-time writer, uh, six years. They're not all novels. Like, in there are probably 25 novellas, and then 20 novellas, and then some short novels. Well, what's a short novel for you? You write long. Yeah, so my so my novels are like seventy to a hundred, um, and then a, so a short novel would be like forty to fifty. Yeah, or wow. th thirty-five to fifty. That's yeah. still a whole lot of words. A whole lot of words. Uh, a quick reminder: it is a, yeah. yeah. 
ask questions if you have them. I, I'm, sorry, Zoe's frozen again. Uh, people who are listening, ask questions if you have them. I am going to wrap this up in a few minutes, but I wanted to ask Zoe. So you're doing this YouTube. Uh, you have a YouTube channel sort of about indie publishing and you did this huge like trope project where you took mm -hmm. you surveyed i mean hundreds of readers about like their favorite tropes and romance were you shocked like how did tell tell us a little bit about that yeah so so the trope project is ongoing um so the first wave of the trope project was my own newsletter so out of my own newsletter we got about 1200 responses Responses. Wow. And then from social media, I added a bit more. But I'm not surprised because the majority of the responses so far have come from my newsletter. So I'm not surprised by, like, they put um, the grouchy one loves the sunshiny one as number one trope and love triangle last. But like if, you know, if you ask somebody who, who writes love triangles and writes them really, really well, if they sent the same survey out to their mailing list, you'd get, I think, different results, right? But um, So that's kind of the next wave. You're like marriage and jeopardy queen. And that was pretty far down the list. <laughs> I mean, I feel like you have a lot of people oh, yeah. who are like, I don't yeah. like this, but I'll read it from you, which is amazing. Yeah, that, that was really far down the list, in fact. And I already knew that. Like, I had that instinct before I did the survey. The survey was because people were asking me, in fiction, that um, is, it's about writing series, kind of. And in it, I said, your first book in the series, ideally, don't do what I do. Don't pick your favorite niche trope that is your catnip, but not everyone's catnip. Pick the grouchy one is, you know, is warm for the sun, the shiny one. That one, always. That, that should be book one of every series. And people said, well, how do you know? How do you know what trope is number one? And I'm like, well, you know, I don't know. You just know. How do you know? Yeah, Which is not know. actually the right question. The right question is, and so that's why I did the survey to, to give data so I can say, with caveats, here's some raw data and do with it what you will. Um, I do think that, that like Mary Trouble, well, I can make appealing, more appealing than, you know, but it, it really should be buried. Like there, there will be a marriage and trouble story in Kincaid's of Pine Harbor, but it'll be four or five. Right. Like, you know, right. Well, I mean, that's, I mean, in part of your promise of like the trauma is behind, I mean, you get to bury that trauma in several different books and then, and then heal from it in their book. I mean, that's an exciting, I mean, that's the Zoe York promise. Yeah. yeah. That's the Zoe York promise. Um, I just want to give a very nice to Julie in the comments who just asked the next by Facebook will come out. Um, because the answer is probably never. I'm sorry, Julie. Um, not never, never. Like if I if I need to write it, um, then I then I will write it. But every so often, um, I I write a science fiction book. That's something my readers actively, other than Julie, loves it. Um, I have 15 readers who really love my sci-fi, and uh, 30,000 who send me messages. I dare yeah, spend some time. They're willing to let me write Ainsley books, but when I write, oh, so what I need to do is move my sci-fi to a secret. Oh no. Yeah, well, sci-fi is hot right now. Sorry, like, Julie. You could make some. You could make some mayhem in the in the sci-fi. Yeah, you, it's hot right now. Um, Zoe, you are breaking up, and I feel like this is. If we're at thirty-four minutes again. I thought yes. we were twenty. <laughs> So we're going to we're going to call it here. But I, I want to really quickly, I wore my for our Canada, for our May 2-4 weekend, I wore my Muskoka dinner jacket and I wore my um, Handmaid's Tale T-shirt for our quality Canadian content. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, I really appreciate it. Stay safe. Stay home. Have a drink. Read a book. Thanks. Zoe, thanks for being here, guys.